Now at six. I'm nervous about the chemicals that are in the environment that we don't know very much about. Chemicals all around us. I'm nervous about the way that I might be affecting my children's health. In the air, in our home. Fire retardants and carpets uh, that are cancer causing. The buildup. 50, 60, 70 percent of the reason you get a disease is not just from your genes. The side effects. But, but from your environment. Tonight, KGW investigates a first of its kind tool that reveals what we're exposed to. Just because there's not a lot of information out there. Tonight, a KGW investigation about chemicals that we're all exposed to each day. They're hidden in a lot of cleaners, our personal products, even our carpets. We wanted to find out just how many of these chemicals our bodies are soaking up. So we asked Keely Chalmers, environmental reporter and mother of two young kids, to find out. She's live downtown tonight. Keely? Joe and Tracy, you may have noticed over the last week, I have been wearing this black wristband. Now, it looks and feels basically like those wristbands you see people wearing for social causes, but this one is different. That's because it is tracking all the chemicals I'm being exposed to this week. We can't see them. Most of them we can't smell, but they are all around us in our environment every day. Pollutants, and not just the kind that come from factories or cars, but the kind that are in the things many of us touch and use daily. Our carpets, beds, shampoos, and lotions. Chemicals that by and large are not regulated. Chemicals experts say are absorbing into our bodies and our kids. Neurotoxins and exposure to some of these chemicals early in life are changing IQ points just enough so that there's millions more children who are in the range of, of disabled by these uh, chemicals and many millions more children who are out of that range of exceptional. That's scary. <laughs> Mother of three, Bethany Thomas, tries to live a healthy lifestyle. We buy natural products as much as possible. But still worries about the things she can't control. I'm nervous about the chemicals that are in the environment that we don't know very much about and the way that they're affecting our health. Which is why she volunteered to find out exactly what chemicals she and her family are encountering. Bethany is one of 25 volunteers across the country taking part in an experiment by the Environmental Defense Fund. The project is called A Week in Chemicals. For one week, she'll wear this special chemical tracking wristband. I also volunteered to wear one. I mark the date and time when I put the wristband on, and one week later I'll put it back in the sterile bag and send it off to a lab for testing. A lab that just so happens to be right down the road at Oregon State University. The way chemicals are used in the U.S. is that we don't necessarily test them before they're put into commerce. Professor Kim Anderson helped develop the wristband. 50, 60, 70 percent of the reason you get a disease is not just from your genes, but, but from your environment. Over the last year, she and her colleagues tested the bands on hundreds of people from around the world. But the professor says perhaps the most shocking findings came from a test group of three to five year olds. Almost all the wristbands worn by the children tested positive for flame retardants very large quantities over the course of just a few days. And the ones with the highest levels? They were the ones worn by kids who lived in well-vacuumed homes. Turns out the more the vacuuming, the higher the level of flame retardants found. The National Institutes of Health have linked flame retardant exposure to memory and learning problems, lower IQ, and advanced puberty. When the particles are getting caught, but that the vapor still goes out the back end of the, of the vacuum cleaner. Every single day we're using all kinds of consumer products that have toxic chemicals embedded in them. Senator Jeff Merkley has been pushing for stricter federal regulations on chemicals and the products we use. There's some 80,000 different chemicals, new ones introduced without ever being tested. That's one of the things our legislation uh, will now do. You can't introduce a new molecule without making sure it's uh, safe for, to use in consumer products. He says the current laws regulating chemicals in our country are nearly 40 years old and they desperately need to be updated. He and many others hope by finding out exactly what we're exposed to, we can start to make healthier choices. You can't change your genes, but you can change your environment. So tomorrow marks the end of my week-long test. At noon, I will take off this wristband. I will put it in this special bag, and I will send it off to be tested. Now, I'm told...
scientists will test for some 1,400 different chemicals. The entire process will take about a month. And of course, we will let you know exactly what we find out at that time. Back to you. Very interesting, Keely. We'll look forward to it. Thank you. If you have a story idea for the KGW investigators, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us by email at investigators at KGW.com. You can also give us a call. The number to our 24-hour tip line is on your screen. We do have some breaking news. A shooting outside a North Portland bar called the Twilight Room. Sky 8 showing the streets roped off and a police response there. KGW's Nina Melhoff is live on the scene tonight. Nina. Well, good evening, Tracy. Uh, gang detectives are here investigating a shooting in which a 20 year old man has been shot and injured. He has non life threatening injuries. Here's a look at that Twilight Room bar here on North Lombard. Uh, Boulevard here and it's pretty popular with University of Portland students. We're told by witnesses and police that there was a shooting here at about 430 this afternoon. A witness nearby that was hanging out at a bar said he heard about four gunshots. He stepped outside to see two cars driving down the street, turning on Portsmouth and then again shooting at each other in the cars about five more shots on Portsmouth. So tonight parts of Lombard and Portsmouth are shut down with uh, lots of police out here investigating. But folks who heard these shots, you know, say it, they wouldn't be surprised if it is gang related, but they did hear about nine shots altogether. And then both of those cars took off. Now, what led police to this scene was that 20 year old man showed up at his grandmother's house just a few blocks down the street injured. She called 911, so a lot to investigate on uh, that shooting suspect out here, but be advised of the streets closed in this area. Back to you. Thank you, Nina. An Amber Alert out of Idaho has been canceled tonight. Two children are safe after a driver spotted their father's vehicle in Cowlitz County. This is the second successful Amber Alert we've seen in less than a week. KGW's Mike Benner is live in Longview, and Mike, in both cases, the Amber Alert system worked really within minutes. Yeah, that's right, Tracy. In fact, just last week, a three-year-old girl was found in less than 20 minutes, and today, two- and three-year-old siblings were found in a little more than 20 minutes. Police say on Monday, a guy by the name of Joshua Rivas kidnapped his two children from their Nampa, Idaho home. That's just to the west of Boise. Right away, there was concern because of Rivas's mental state and comments he made to his wife, the mother of the kids. Plus, he took all of the kids' belongings as well as some camping gear. Just after 2.15 this afternoon, an Amber Alert went out. Half hour later, an alert driver on I-5 in Cowlitz County spotted the van and called 911. Police pulled Rivas over in the Castle Rock area. We spoke with the tow truck driver who eventually hauled away the van. He says the kids said they were headed for the border. His thoughts tonight are with them and the mom. I, I can't imagine what she's going through sitting there. Her kids are gone. She's don't know if she's going to see him again. You hear stuff like this go bad and it sounds like it's going to go good. They're in CPS custody right now, and she's on her way over here from Idaho to get the kids. And there's a live look at the Revis minivan in a tow truck lot here in Longview. Joshua Revis is in the process of being booked into the Cowlitz County Jail. His first court appearance should be tomorrow. Safe to say they'll be discussing extradition. Back to you. Mike, thanks. A state trooper's SUV ended up on its top after a bad crash in Vancouver. This was the scene at SR 503 in Fourth Plain this afternoon. 35 year old Washington State Trooper Nicholas Jennings was driving the Chevy Tahoe. He was hurt, but we just checked with WSP and they say his injuries were minor. 39 year old Brian Rohan was driving a Nissan pickup truck. The two vehicles collided in that intersection. Authorities are still investigating what caused that crash. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. That's what victims who've been secretly recorded during their most private moments have been telling us for months now. That could soon change. A bill to make video voyeurism a felony just moved one step closer to becoming law. Mark Hanrahan is live in Oregon City tonight. Mark, one question we had is who in the world would be opposed to this? Tracy, that's a good question. No lawmakers that we're aware of have publicly come out against this law. In fact, two members of the Senate Judiciary Committee told me today that's the committee that approved the bill this morning and opted to move it forward, said this legislation makes sense. 
Inside the state capitol today, House Bill 2356 cleared another hurdle. Yeah, it would make it a felony. The legislation championed by former lawmaker Denise Bowles would make invasion of personal privacy a felony. Right now, secretly recording someone during their most private moments is a misdemeanor in Oregon, even if the victim is a child. Right now, it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter how many times this crime is committed, it is always a misdemeanor. Bowles says the bill would also give the judge the ability to make the defendant register as a sex offender. Today, the House Judiciary Committee voted unanimously in favor of it. This bill is about making sure that we're all safe in our homes and safe from people basically spying on us. State Senator Sarah Gelser says she voted for the bill after hearing from victims in hidden camera cases and how painful the experiences were for them. She is a trusting person, and that trust is gone. Sally Crane says her daughter is one of those victims. She says the teen was house sitting for Kurt Higgins over the summer when she found two small hidden cameras in the bathroom. Room Higgins urged her to use. The 52 year old is now facing three counts of attempted invasion of personal privacy. Those are misdemeanors. My hopes for this is that the laws are changed. My hopes for this are that there are stricter penalties, way beyond a misdemeanor for all of these potential offenders. House Bill 2356 won't affect her daughter's case, but she's hopeful it becomes law. Right now, she and others believe the punishment in these cases is far too lenient. All right, so the bill now has two more hurdles to clear before it makes its way to the governor's desk for her consideration. That first hurdle is the Ways and Means Committee. Then the second hurdle after that would be the full Senate for a vote. So we'll continue to track this bill, and we'll keep you updated. Back to you. Thanks, Mark. New tonight, an unfortunate update on a story you saw only on KGW. On Monday, we profiled a local bicyclist who's been helping reunite people with their stolen bikes. While Demetrius Cooper was watching this story on TV that night, his bike was stolen. This is what his green and white Trek bike looks like. Cooper says he left it chained to a fence outside a friend's apartment on Southwest 12th in Columbia. And someone cut the fence to steal it. The bike theft task force is helping to look for it, and Cooper has reported it stolen on bikeindex.org. Parents in Estacada are concerned tonight after high school students were lined up and asked very personal questions about sex, virginity, physical abuse, and a host of other sensitive topics. The district says it was all part of a student-led program held during Unity Week. KGW's Chris Willis is live in the newsroom. And Chris, the focus was actually to celebrate students' differences? Yeah, Tracy, it was. This story came to our attention this morning from our news partner, KXL, FM News 101, and reporter Rosemary Reynolds. It got our attention for many reasons. Some hard to believe. So we called the district, and the principal invited us out to talk about it. He stands by the intention of Unity Week, but he says this kind of thing probably won't happen again. A good citizen is somebody who's aware of others' differences and has a way to respect them and not always agree with them. At Estacada High School, they're teaching kids to be good citizens. At this year's Unity Week, the focus was celebrating the differences. Students lined up in the gym and asked personal questions, some a little too personal. And not putting your child in a situation that maybe he might, he or she might not feel comfortable with. The exercise was focused on building unity and bringing kids together. It's all part of a national confidence program for kids called Cross the Line. And the questions are asked without adults present. We got a list of the questions, more than 120 of them. Most are basic, but these are some that got parents' attention. Topics on virginity, sexual orientation, alcohol, suicide, and physical abuse. Today, the principal told us that might have been a mistake. Parents had legitimate concerns and questions. We're going to address those. We're going to make sure we don't make the same mistake twice. Some parents told us they just didn't like the line of questions, but others said if the school would have sent the questions home first, Parents could have talked to their kids about it. I wouldn't subject them to something that I thought would be uncomfortable for them. Yeah. But that's my choice to make, not the school's choice. Just so I can make sure that my child is comfortable. The program is likely scrapped, but the intent is not. Principal Sullivan says he's going to continue to emphasize respect, diversity, and celebrating differences in all his students. He'll just do it with a more watchful eye. For right now, we're putting it on hold, and we're looking at other ways that we can try to accomplish the same positive things as this activity did so that we can continue to focus on reducing bullying and having mutual respect for one another. Principal Sullivan interviewed the student leaders who asked the questions, and they admitted a few may have been ad-lib. They might have gone off script once or twice, but they say 
Kids in the school are talking about it, responded to it, and that was their goal, to unite each other through their differences. The program will likely not be around next year. Tracy? Modified, at the very least. Thank you, Chris.